It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Tammy Tan, Marketing Programs Manager at COFAX. Tammy, the floor is yours. Welcome to the webinar, Five Myths, Stifling the Adoption of Supplier Self-Service Tools. I'd like to start today's session by introducing our presenters. First up, we have Ms. Amy Fong, Purchase to Pay Program Leader and Senior Procurement Advisor at the Hackett Group. Amy has 17 years of experience in both industry and consulting with a focus on procurement, supply chain, and organizational effectiveness. She has considerable experience in managing complex global supply chain partnerships, supplier performance and relationship management, sourcing and cost improvement for the North American, Asian, and South Pacific markets. We also have Art Sarno, Product Marketing Director at COFAX. Art has a very strong background in social media and big data analytics, enterprise content management, imaging and document management, business process management, and business intelligence. Prior to COFAX, Art held several positions at companies such as OpenText and Unisys. Today, we also have Prem Balamudi, Senior Sales Engineer for AP Solutions at COFAX. He will be sharing a very interesting demo with us today. Prem has over 15 years of experience working with AP automation development tools and applications. He's responsible for providing technical expertise for the AP automation solutions to our customers. Prem joined COFAX from 170 Systems where he held several positions in professional services in the consulting and solution architecture groups. You can read uh, their full bios on the slide. We have a great agenda for you today. Um, Ms. Amy Fong is gonna start off uh, with an introduction to um, supplier self-service portals um, and solutions, and also go through the five myths and tips for success. And Art is going to take us through the COFAX um, solutions, the market drivers for supplier portals and walk us through some of the use cases for Supplier Express. And Prem is gonna go out next and uh, give us a demo of um, the uh, Supplier Express and uh, Art is going to uh, wrap up today's session for us. Now, uh, before I turn it over to our presenters, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions, please type it in the Q&A box so we can address them later during the, the webinar. A recording of this webinar will also be made available. I'll now turn it over to Amy to kick off the presentation. Thank you, Tammy. Hi, everyone. This is Amy Fong, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, presenting today. Thanks for joining. Uh, so we're, we're going to go through um, a few different topics today. Primarily, I'm going to talk about uh, where supplier portals fit in your technology roadmap, and then some of the myths that we really commonly hear when we're talking to companies out there considering this kind of technology. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Hackett, I'll give you the 30-second overview just so you know who I am. Uh, Hackett is a uh, benchmarking, consulting, and advisory uh, organization, and we define world-class performance. We've been doing benchmarking for a long time. We work with most of the Fortune 1000 companies out there. Um, we have three parts of the business. We have benchmarking, which is deep measurement, uh, looking across all of GNA. Uh, we're very specific benchmarks within the purchase to pay space. Uh, we do a purchase to pay study that's actually open right now. Uh, we have on the right here business transformation consulting. We call that transformation. That's what you would think of as project work uh, with the team on the ground to help you with maybe system selection implementation or just uh, broader strategic planning and uh, process improvement. And then we have a membership advisory program, which uh, gives our members access to our ongoing research, our benchmarks, and advisors like myself. Uh, that's kind of in the middle here. It's an ongoing relationship, and it's something often organizations look to, to be, a, you know, work with us on a, a multi-year basis, maybe when they don't have a, an acute need for a benchmark or a project, but they still want to continuously improve and get uh, expert insights and uh, work with their peers. Uh, so we've got a program that we've been doing for about 10 years focused on uh, finance, procurement, 
uh, HR and IT, and I'm specifically, I lead up our purchase to pay program in the advisory space. I will um, mention uh, world-class or top performance a few times in the course of this webcast, and i like to just show you what we mean by those terms. Hackett very specifically has very specific definitions for uh, what we consider top performance. And if, if you have, haven't seen this before, this is our value grid, this little graphic here. Um, essentially, we think to be a high-performing organization, you need to be high on efficiency as well as high on effectiveness. You can't just do things really fast with no regard for cost, uh, or really, really well with no regard for cost, and you can't do things really uh, cheaply with no regard for the outputs. So we look at uh, a series of output metrics, about 20 of them, and we have a uh, proprietary uh, formula that we put all of the, the companies we measure into, and each company comes out on this value grid, each of these little white dots is a company. Those that are in the top quartile on effectiveness and efficiency are what we consider top performers. So when I'm comparing top performers, it's a group of companies uh, that are exceedingly high in performance, the outputs, the value that they deliver to the business, and we compare those to the rest of the companies out there. So you can empirically see the difference in, in what they're doing to drive that performance. So let's jump into the supplier portal topic now. Um, I want to just give a quick, you know, explanation for what we think of as supplier portals. And, and the short, you know, explanation would be that portals are really any kind of technology that allows the supplier to exchange information with the, the buyer, uh, typically hosted on a buyer site or through a uh, buyer-specific uh, software platform, maybe in the cloud, maybe hosted, but uh, some type of platform that the buyer manages that can exchange information directly to the supplier. And there's a lot of ways we see portals being used. Um, the, most, the, the most straightforward, I would say, and one of the earlier usages is uh, invoice tracking and processing and inquiry support. Uh, so, you know, a supplier needs to understand whether their invoice has been paid yet. They can go on a site to see it or look it up on a tool to see that to have visibility. Onboarding new suppliers is another way uh, where a supplier can go on board and or go online and complete a lot of the, the paperwork, the information, the questionnaires that are required uh, through a, a portal, saves a lot of back and forth and a lot of input on the company side and that supplier would need to provide that info anyway. Um, maintenance of existing master records, supplier master data. So you know, updating an address change, for instance, or changing uh, payment information or contact numbers, things like that. Uh, order tracking, so being able to look at POs and order acknowledgments. And then also more sophisticated use would be supplier performance and relationship management. So supplier scorecards uh, shared online, and in some cases even innovative activities where suppliers are participating and collaborating with their, with the buyer team, with the, with the R&D team maybe, and submitting ideas and reviewing viewing um, upcoming projects and, and uh, often it's, a, it's an entree uh, early on into the sourcing process. So, you know, obviously the term portal is pretty broad. What we're mainly going to focus on today is those first three really um, and primarily uh, invoice tracking and processing and the use of portals uh, to, to manage or to support the invoice process. So, and, and that's often where we see uh, portals starting to be used. So I wanted to get that clear. Uh, we do have a bit of a maturity curve or maturity model that we, we have a pretty complex maturity model, but specifically for supplier self-service uh, that goes through our four levels. And, and what we see is the basic level of lagging is kind of the manual paper-based process. So we're sending paper back and forth, maybe emails, maybe phone. Uh, each business unit has their own process. There's not a lot of data standardized across groups. Uh, then companies tend to move up through uh, what we call achieving, which is mainly static content. Uh, so you may use portals or networks for outbound communication. Uh, you may have a form, you know, you may have a, a basic for survey type form that goes out to get information. Uh, and transactional information may be available to suppliers online. Uh, suppliers are, are able to update some of their master data. And in our maturity models, the achieving level is about the middle 50th percentile of, of organizations. So you'd say about half of companies are in that achieving level. It's a pretty common place to be. Uh, the bottom quartile are typically, bottom 25% typically at that lagging level. 
exceeding um, usually the top uh, 35 to 20, you know, 25 to 35 percent of companies are in uh, supplier are in these exceeding where they're using basic transactional uh, updates through supplier through portals. Uh, so networks provide some on-demand access to self-service activities. Um, often there's real-time or near real-time performance management in there. Sometimes there's a supplier 360 type assessment. Uh, and master data primarily is maintained through supplier self-service, meaning that you've, you know, had the supplier take a hand in actually keeping their own data up to date. Um, and then the leading edge, you know, that top 10, 10 percent of companies uh, that are really pushing the boundaries of this technology are doing real-time visibility and exception management uh, through portals, meaning that the suppliers are really using portals to, to submit information, but also to collaborate, uh, do on-demand, do demand forecasting, uh, exchange, you know, forward-looking information that can help them plan their business, uh, more cross-collaboration, cross-functional collaboration, like I mentioned, or with engineering, with supply chain, quality, uh, and there's often a lot of analytics involved so that you're using these portals and these, these forms of communication for continuous improvement to drive the business looking forward uh, and in a much pro, more proactive way. And again, that's kind of the, the, the most mature state. Um, you're only going to find about 10% of companies up there, and the majority of companies are aiming to be somewhere in these middle two levels. And, and that's really probably where we'll focus today. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of the really sophisticated stuff because realizing most of the people on this, this call are probably in, you know, stage one or two wanting to get up to three. So I want to show a couple of things. Um, what we do see is that the top performers that I mentioned earlier, um, when, you know, one of the key uses of, of uh, one of the key things we measure is how they address their inquiries in the AP process. We're going to hone a little, hone back into AP here. Um, and when we look at, uh, this is from a couple years ago, our, our latest P2P study, uh, when we look at how inquiries are addressed, and again, inquiries are, you know, anybody contacting you, internal or external, to say, where's my uh, invoice, where's my check, where's my ACH, uh, has payment, you know, has this been approved, are you missing documentation, did you receive it in the mail, whatever, just very basic questions that typically uh, require some response back. We still see email and we see calls as the most common, but what we see is that top performers are really emerging in terms of using self-service on the internet or on an intranet internally with their employees. Um, and when we look a little bit deeper into that, we see that the, the percentage of those companies that are actually using the self-service that have a portal tool, uh, the percentage of their actual inquiries being used are pretty high for the top performers. So what they're able to do is once they put in a solution like this, uh, they, they put about 50% of those calls into it. Now imagine the person that's taking all those calls, their workload is reduced by 50% for routine tasks, and they can really focus now on more complex things like, hey, this invoice really was lost in the mail, right, and we need to do something about it, or we really do have a discrepancy here, or we really need to work with the, the uh, buyers to improve our process so our POs and our, our invoices match better. Um, or whatever the more strategic work to be done is. So we've seen um, a bit of a shift, and, and what I expect, I mentioned our studies open now, is that this increase in, this, this number is going to increase quite a bit in our newer data. Uh, I, I would say that when we list out the technologies in AP, portals and, and any kind of self-service tools really are emerging as one of the, the leading uh, newer technologies that people are adopting. And so let's talk more about that, um, because when I have this conversation, you know, when we talk to uh, our and COFAX and, and other uh, providers, and we talk a lot, Hackett has about 150 different companies we work with in our P2P program, specific, specifically P2P process owners. Uh, when we talk about portals, there are a lot of things that come up. And so we approach this from kind of a, a mixed perspective, because it seems like a technology that sounds good on paper, but a lot of people are pretty resistant to actually turn it on. Uh, so we wanted to address some of the, the myths about this kind of technology and, and why uh, you may want to consider it even if you thought it wasn't for you. Um, so the first one is I hear a lot that our requirements are too complicated. Um, and 
you know, the the truth behind this really is that that everybody's respond, uh, requirements are complicated. Nobody's, you know, invoicing is, is very simple. Some are certainly more complicated than others. Uh, but we have seen quite a few customers and suppliers that have been successful in automating um, the, the requirements for onboarding, for data setup, um, and partly because of self-service uh, software. So one thing we see, especially when we're looking at onboarding suppliers, is that the, the more complex the company, the more different, uh, different checklists and people are getting in and asking the supplier for data. Um, I saw a very, very large professional services firm recently that had roadmapped this out or mapped out where all of their checklists were, where all of the, the forms and data collection was coming from, from when they bring on a new supplier. And there were about 10 or 20 different, different places depending on the supplier. That's pretty complicated for the supplier. Unifying that into a single portal uh, and a single process stream of information uh, is certainly uh, better for the supplier and better for the company. Um, so, you know, when you're looking, when you feel that you're very complicated uh, and you have a lot of requirements, uh, our suggestion is that you look for a solution that's highly configurable, um, that does have a workflow of setup tools that can be used by non-technical staff. And a lot of the, you know, you'll see a demo later today, um, a lot of the tools out there, uh, the workflow is fairly easy to configure. You don't need to be a programmer to be able to do it. Uh, allows for complex processes to be modeled, even having like reference models that you can you can copy from what another company did and learn what others have done, learn from what others have done. Um, a solution that simplifies the user experience and also that has uh, multi-language capabilities. I know that's a really big one for global companies. Um, and also provides traceability. So, you know, automating some of these processes where, you know, you may have paper flowing around now to, to get all the information you need or to manage updates or to provide updates to suppliers, uh, being able to put that into a workflow solution certainly uh, provides more traceability. Automation in general, in general can reduce human error and it also reduces subjectivity. Um, to make sure you you, fit, you know you complete all the proper steps. So if you have ten checklists happening right now, uh, and you're looking to you know and you're you're relying on that, having all those checklists in an automated way is is going to uh, bolster that process because you're not relying on somebody that they don't skip a step, right? Which can happen pretty easily. Um, you know we all we're all subject to human error. Um, when we talk about, you know, I'm not sure what happened here. <laughs> That's just a key usability features, um, but it looks like V's instead of Y's. Uh, but when we're talking about improving the supplier's online experience, which is really important in any kind of uh, any kind of online adoption to get suppliers onto uh, a solution. Um, you know, there are, there are some key steps that we see. Um, one is maintaining master data and making uh, upload utilities available so it's easier for suppliers, easier to use online forms. Uh, submitting invoices through things like PO Flip or one click. Uh, invoice creation, um, allowing utilities, uh, you know, data utilities where suppliers can, can correct their information easily. Um, viewing status 24-7, so uh, offering, you know, individually branded dashboards to suppliers, um, accessing them on mobile devices, prioritized alert lists for managing exceptions, um, basically supplier self-service type portals, um, and allowing a way to research discrepancies. So. Uh, filters that, that allow them to, to search by keywords, step-by-step uh, -step audit trails where you can see what's been done by a supplier or internally, and also ways to send messages to a customer that are linked to a PO or an invoice. And there's some uh, solutions out there, including Cofax, that are doing a lot of these things that are pretty interesting. So, you know, I, I share this graphic because I think it's a great checklist. Um, essentially, when you're looking to, to implement any kind of um, solution across the P2P process, you know, or specifically an AP, what, what some of our tips are, first of all, you want to look at eliminating any unneeded steps and forms and approvals. Um, that company I mentioned that had 10 or 20 different checklists from different groups in the organization, you know, one of the first things they had to do was look across all of those and say, what's, what's common information and what can we cut down on? Um, think about it from the point of the point of view of the supplier. So we often hear that you know the, um, the portal kind of solutions are too complex for the supplier. 
Um, it, the forms aren't any less complex typically for the supplier. What you need to pr look at is, you know, is the supplier providing a piece of information one time or are they providing it 10 times? Um, are they having to answer 100 questions and can we get that down to 10 questions? You know, what's really necessary and what's overcomplicated? Uh, make sure that the usability features in the tool are enabled. Often people don't turn things on. Uh, they try to keep it simple, but too simple. Um, budget for a high level of initial onboarding uh, support. So, uh, you know, bringing suppliers onto any solution and bringing internal users on any solution where it does require uh, some level of support. Um, I typically, you know, uh, tell companies that they need to think about this up front and budget for it and plan it in. Um, certainly expect this from the vendor and work with the vendor on how implementation is going to work, uh, but you can't just sit back and expect that a vendor is going to do all of it. Your software vendor can do very much of it and, and hold that expectation out there, uh, but there's, there's an internal role as well. Um, also think about, you know, putting requirements to use the portal into your, your onboarding requirements for suppliers. So, you know, when you RFP them, when you uh, contract with them, have expectations for how these technologies will work into your process and, and how they'll utilize them. Um, so the complexity is one we often hear. Uh, fraud is another, another thing that's often brought up. And, uh, I think fraud is an interesting question. Obviously, in AP, we all worry about fraud. Um, anytime money is is uh, is changing hands, right? And there's there's uh, a need for control, and finance people tend to be pretty conservative around control. Um, the truth is, you do need to have the right controls, right? We're not going to tell you that you can you can open the floodgates. Um, the, the the reality is, an automated process can just it can be much more secure than a paper based process. Um, I think a lot of people put a lot of faith into, you know, I received this on the supplier's letterhead. Um, in reality, I think any of us could draw up letterhead on, on a PowerPoint or, you know, a, a Photoshop application in about 10 minutes these days. So what works to prevent fraud way back is not necessarily uh, the same things we need to prevent fraud now. Um, that's not to say we, you know, allow, you know, we, we accept anything, uh, but I think we need to take a real hard look at what we're trusting and, and you know, paper's not necessarily any more reliable. Um, the same, you know, security levels that, that allow us to, to do things online in our, our private life can be applied in business-to-business -business transactions. And it's pretty interesting because I think that there's been a real, um, you know, movement forward. And, you know, most of us have probably transacted with our bank online. Um, I, I know, you know, some, of, some people haven't, a few, but uh, for the most part, you know, it's pretty easy to open a bank account online, to transfer money, to do a lot of things online uh, these days, to buy anything. And we're pretty secure in that. We know the technology behind it is robust. Um, and when there's a breach, we, we take action. We have a process, right? And we, we can typically catch it. Um, but we're, we're, we put our trust in that. Uh, there's been a little bit slower advance to, to trust that in the B2B space, but that technology can be applied. Um, and it's, you know, again, cautions are required, but uh, it's not certainly not a free-for-all to go online. Um, there's, there's a lot of best practices that are uh, we suggest to incorporate supplier, uh, to incorporate security in supplier portal use, um, you know, building notifications into the system, having email alerts when any kind of sensitive information is uh, changed, and having that go to um, other individuals with the, the equivalent level of authority. So, you know, it's it's likely that you're going to actually get more visibility in some of these changes uh, that are made as you have an automated system. Um, and of course, things like password controls and dig digital signature controls. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these because we have limited time today, but I know that uh, all of you have access to the paper that we wrote on this, and there's uh, so you are able to download that and certainly get a lot more uh, detail on some of the practices that we recommend. Um, and some of this is just general good hygiene, you know, uh, repeated failures at logging in should uh, trigger some kind of review of a situation, you know, and, and I, I also agree with the last two here that in general um, visibility and managers letting employees know that there, any changes they make are, are being viewed and are being tracked um, and anything, you know, inappropriate will result in termination. Um, often it's the culture and the behavior that's just as important as the, the controls around it. 
Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on fraud because that's not what this whole <laughs> webcast is about, but certainly an important area. Um, and the message there really is just that, uh, you know, fraud controls are important, uh, but going online and, and automating these, these kind of processes does not uh, open yourself up to fraud any more than, than paper does or phone calls do. Um, the next myth is that our requirements are, are too global and complex. Um, and the global argument of, you know, we have a lot of requirements uh, that self-service isn't appropriate for comes up a lot. Um, there's certainly a need when you're a global company uh, with a very – or even have a global supply base to offer uh, support in multiple languages, offer currency conversion, offer regulatory and tax documentation that's pretty complicated. Um, but what we've seen, though, is that a lot of the legacy ERP systems really fall short on this. And also just having, you know, individuals in your, in your central office, your central AP organization, uh, they may fall short on this as well because, you know, rarely do we have AP managers that are AP uh, processors that are speaking 10 different languages, right? Um, so multilingual support um, is typically available through these portal solutions, and it's often better what you're better than what you're able to offer just through individuals. Um, most all of the vendors, I would say, offer some level of multi-language support. When you look at the cloud providers that are out there today, companies like Cofax, um, I, I heard you know concerns four or five years ago about character recognition um, of, of other languages, and that, a lot of those have been resolved, and the technology has really advanced beyond that now. Um, the leading solutions also support non-U.S. regulatory documentation requirements. So, you know, where you may have uh, 20 different company, countries you're working with that have different regulatory requirements, a system like this, especially like COFAC, has, you know, reference documents where they'll help you to understand what all of those requirements are in different uh, locations uh, to help you, you know, cover that checklist. Uh, some of some of the, the tips that we offer here is, you know, working with the field, understanding from your users internally uh, what are the languages that your suppliers are operating in, what needs to be covered, you know, and, and that, sh that should apply uh, whether you're automated or not, but it's important to do that. Not everybody does. Um, also be prepared to have some language issues in the system, um, but typically when those issues do come up, there's a pretty straightforward bug fix or maintenance support ticket that can, that can work them out with the software vendor. Software vendors like Cofax and others are uh, working with, you know, many different clients in these companies, so they're able to resolve these kind of issues pretty quickly, whereas you working alone may have, you know, you may need to call in an interpreter, right, or work with a local local field rep to resolve some issues. Um, do encourage your local and your regional suppliers to start using things like electronic submission of invoice. Um, the, the carrot there, uh, encouraging global adoption, is that, Typically, an, uh, an invoice submitted electronically is going to get to you much faster than something sent through international mail um, or, you know, sent uh, to a central location or even to a local location on paper. Um, and that's going to enable them to be paid faster or to have their payment approved faster and have real-time visibility of their, of their orders and their invoices. There's less likelihood of things getting lost. Um, or losing that traceability. So big push, um, lots of incentive to the suppliers in a global environment really to use this kind of uh, application. The next myth is that our ERP system is so customized it's really costly to add features. And I hear this both from those that have a real, you know, top of the line, brand new, brand spanking new ERP system, and I also hear it from those that have you know, uh, I don't want to name names, I'm trying not to for ERPs, but have a legacy ERP system that was implemented 15 years ago and they can't seem to get out of that, um, or multiple ERP systems. You know, that's a common problem that, you know, you have two or three different ERP systems uh, through uh, mergers and acquisitions or, or other historical happenings. Um, and, and it's hard to uh, change them. So this is a real challenge uh, for companies to extend their existing P2P systems um, or build or maintain data interfaces into those systems. Um, building out your existing systems that's in, inflexible can be just as expensive as building as adding on a new tool. In many cases, it's a lot more expensive to do a lot of modifications to your ERP uh, compared to you know just implementing a, a cloud-based tool that that uh, bolts onto it. 
Um, and in reality, we all know that technology for P2P and resources can be limited and, or it's a low priority. It's not customer facing, it's supplier facing, it's back office. We don't always get to be number one or two or five or 10 on the IT's list of projects. Um, so what we see is that a lot of companies are augmenting their legacy systems with some kinds of software as a service uh, solution or cloud-based solution along with their in-house solutions. Um, and you know, the, the, when we look at what companies are doing, this is a question we just asked recently, um, are you adopting cloud-based solutions? And this went to P2P owners. Um, we found that about 45% of them did have a strategy to combine on-premise and cloud solutions. Um, another, you know, this 18% actually wanted to migrate all of their P2P solutions into a, a cloud-based model. Um, and about 25 were looking for, you know, we're, we're primarily looking to stay on site. Um, the, the other 13% are piloting something. So that's in total about 25% who say we're going to stay only on-premise. The other 75% of companies really are looking to uh, utilize cloud-based solutions where it makes sense, or they're looking to go entirely onto the cloud. Uh, so where, you know, when we talked several years ago, I think cloud-based solutions were, you know, a little bit experimental. They're really not now. Uh, the majority of organizations I work with consider this seriously, um, and the 25%, you know, are certainly the minority that don't consider it an option. Um, I want to talk a bit about the vendors that offer, offer some type of supplier portals uh, because I often get this question. Uh, I have people, when we talked about this at our last member forum, come up and say, all right, what do I need to buy to implement a portal? And the reality is often it's something you already have. Uh, often the portal solution or is an is a option that you need to turn on um, or something that you can integrate in. Um, and depending on what your infrastructure is, the answer is going to be different, but the the um, considerations for different types of tools, you know, if, if that are out there. ERP systems often do have some type of portal. Um, the challenge there is that, you know, there's an ease of use issue. It can be challenging for suppliers to adopt it. And the deployment and the, the integration speed can be pretty challenging. Um, uh, just like I said earlier, customizing ERPs or turning on things, deploying different features can be kind of a challenge. Um, there are spend management suites that are kind of the, the integration or the middle ground between these different solutions. Um, often there's some integration issues and supplier adoption is an issue, but uh, they can be easier to use. There's certainly um, niche solutions out there that, that are very flexible, um, may not integrate as well with what you have. And then, of course, there's the, the AP processing and workflow. And, and I would put Cofax, you know, in probably the AP processing and workflow, maybe a little in the spent management suite. Uh, but these are great. These kind of solutions are great if you're looking to, uh, you know, automate your AP process at the same time or you already have one of these solutions and it's a feature you're looking to add on. Uh, they're great for AP-related transaction exchanges. The functional scope um, is often focused on the P2P process, so they have the, the the features and the functions that you need, um, and often it's, you know, like I said, it's a feature already in there that you're, you're able to uh, enable. So just some, you know, an idea uh, of where to look. Um, when we look at uh, um, <clears throat> supplier network solutions, sorry about that. Um, when we look at supplier network solutions supporting the pay to P to P process or the source to pay process, um, we often find that the majority of uh, of parties or, or companies are using uh, separate platforms, separate supplier networks, or separate platforms across their source to pay process. So, you know, there's a few. There's a third that have a single solution for orders and invoicing, um, but they often have something else for sourcing. Um, uh, they're only about 25% have a single network or solution platform that supports source through pay. Um, and then we see another quarter that have, uh, you know, different solutions for sourcing, processing, orders, and invoicing. So, you know, if you are one of those companies that has um, a combination of, of different solutions, you are not alone. Uh, you know, you may have something where you use for e-sourcing, something you use for e-invoicing, and something else for orders um, or catalogs, and that's not uncommon. Uh, the idea to have one, you know, technology platform that covers every single function and source to pay, uh, not necessarily realistic. Now, I know there are a few 
out there that do that. Obviously, about you know 25% are using a supplier network across that. They may not have all of that functionality, um, but it's you know there's a lot of great best of breed solutions as we call them out there, um, and there's also you know some uh, process focused you know P2P focused solutions that may not address everything, but still offer a lot of good thing, good good, uh, good features for you. Um, in terms of tips for success, you know, we say about you look at your whole technology roadmap for opportunities where self-service might make sense through your current providers. Um, again, on, uh, enabling an unused feature. Uh, and we also think a subscription model using a, a cloud or SaaS solution may require less upfront investment, so it's certainly worth looking at. Um, the last one is about the investment, and this is, you know, our, our, a tough one, right? We, we look at this and we think it's not really worth the money. Um, how do we justify this? Um, and the, the truth is that a lot of companies really haven't quantified the time that their P2P team's actually spending answering supplier inquiry and, and invoicing questions, resolving disputes, setting up and maintaining data. Um, technology really can reduce some of this time. And then there's additional features you can layer on top of that, like PO flip or dynamic discounting that add more value, like, um, you know, for instance, reduction of errors uh, in invoices, reduction of discrepancies, or the ability to, to give suppliers discounts on the fly uh, that can help you with your, your savings. Um, inquiry response costs uh, tied in and master data costs um, are reduced through self-service. So when we look at, we, we at Hackett, we quantify um, specifically, you know, the, the cost of each step in the AP process, and we're able to correlate that back to those companies I talked about earlier. Small percentage, so these are these are kind of low numbers still of companies that have adopted solutions, uh, but those that are using portals to, uh, to uh, address um, self-service solutions actually have the lowest inquiry response costs. Uh, of, of any of the other groups that we look at. Some have a special group outside of AP. Um, that may cost more there, but typically it speeds up the processing costs, the invoice processing costs, so overall their AP costs are lower. Uh, specialized group within accounts and payable, same thing, um, or they have their processors handling it, um, which again, they, they should not show up costs for inquiry response, but typically their processing costs are higher. Um, but they do, those that have an, an automated service have almost eliminated the costs or have significantly reduced the costs in this step of the process. Um, and overall, when we look at the overall automation of the AP process, we find that technology really does drive efficiency. Um, we find that when, when companies have a, a combination of technologies, um, and I consider that combination to be things like e-invoicing, um, heavy use of e-invoicing, AP workflow automation, um, portals for inquiries, um, and several other things, but generally they've reduced paper. The cost per invoice is about 40% lower, and their business days to process an invoice are um, two or more days less. Uh, so overall, they're, they're using less time and resources to, to do this. Um, so what I think is important here is to understand your current cost structure and where your time's actually being spent. Uh, you know, our P2P study is open publicly right now for a couple more weeks, so if it's something you're interested in, you can reach out to me or any of the people on this call. We'll get you set up with that to quantify uh, the actual costs of those steps. Um, but if you start to, even if, if you don't do it in a formal way, breaking out, you know, through some kind of value stream mapping or just understanding the steps that your people are, are taking to um, where the money is being spent, where the cost is in your process, um, it can can help you to understand the business case here. Uh, and another thing that we see people doing is implementing, um, encouraging self-service adoption by implementing chargeback for exception or manual processes. I've seen shared service centers where, you know, it's free to do an online order or to do an e-invoice, but if you're having, you know, a, a buyer help you or if you're having a paper invoice or if you call instead of going on the website, you're going to get a charge for that service. Uh, and for GBSs or the global business service centers or shared service centers that uh, do chargebacks, you know, do, changing the cost model for your internal customers based on uh, the type of service they require might be an option to encourage adoption. So I want to wrap this up because I think Art and uh, Prem have some interesting stuff to show. Um, in summary, you know, what, what you really need to do, I think, is understand the pain points in your current process, understand where your costs are, understand where it's a burden to your suppliers for their onboarding, uh, how, how much time it's taking to manage inquiries and, and master data up 
uh, updates. Be realistic and fact-based about your global requirements. Start with the field. Understand your supplier, your supply base and what they need. Uh, streamline and optimize your information needs in parallel with process automation. You've got to look at the process before you put any technology in, uh, but you can't really totally streamline the process without the technology. Um, don't let your current technology hold you back. There's a lot of things that can bolt onto your current technology. So having a, a mix of ERP systems or older ERP systems should not be an excuse anymore or reason anymore to not improve processes and automate. Uh, and also pay attention to your supplier's needs when you're designing a solution. That's really important in this space. And so with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Hackett portion. I'm going to turn it over to Art Sarno now. He's going to talk more specifically about uh, COFAX and what they offer. Um, and I'm always impressed because I think they've got some, some great solutions out there, some great technologies that really align with a lot of the things that I just spoke about. Great. So well, thank you're you. up. Thank you, uh, thank you, Amy, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to skip a couple of sections of the deck so we have time for Prame to uh, show you a demo, which I think is the most important uh, part of our, our section. But just to set context, uh, for COFAX, our AP automation solutions follow the, the typical cycle of capture, extraction, validation, and all the way through. And as you know, there are supplier touch points along this journey, all the way from the validation, where if a supplier is not submitting uh, invoices that are suitable uh, during the uh, scanning and the OCR process, there's a lot of um, improvements that have to be done, redaction and, and uh, uh, you know, the transformation of the product and all of that to get the document uh, to, to a level of perfection where it can be processed. And during the approval cycle, obviously, um, thresholds for spend are set through supplier interactions. And finally, when we do the ERP posting, uh, our vendor master data has to be current and all of that has to align. So. It does touch the entire area of the, uh, of the AP cycle. In the case of COFAX, we have two AP solutions. AP Agility is our solution built on our smart process application platform, Total Agility. And it's oriented toward customers that through merger or acquisition have got multiple ERPs, and they also have processes that they want to be able to standardize across these, and uh, also require, because of the extensive, unique way that they handle AP, they have customization requirements and enhancements that one would not find uh, out of the box. Uh, MarkView, which is our flagship product for Oracle, EBS, and SAP, uh, has been in the market for close to 20 years. And uh, co companies such as Google and Twitter and DreamWorks and hundreds of others are using the product. Uh, this product also follows the same pattern, except that it's designed to be within the context of the application. So an Oracle user, for example, is looking at transactions within the Oracle environment. And the supplier component of this, which runs on the Oracle solution, our SAP solution, and our AP Agility solution, is a hosted solution that's available optionally to our customers. And of course, the goal is that we want to provide a secure cloud for supplier interactions. And this involves submission, invoice status, uh, interaction, uh, you'll see that uh, in some of the ROI data I have in the deck that 20, 25, 30 percent of the time spent with suppliers is through routine communications. You see some of them there. When am I going to get paid? Where is my invoice? Uh, we have the ability to flip a PO to an invoice. Uh, we're looking at things like dynamic discounting. We're collecting a lot of analytics on the way to assess supplier spent. And the panel that's given to the supplier, the dashboard, if you will, gives them a daily status, real time, of the interactions between them and uh, AP and also the status of all of their invoices, payments throughout the transaction. So that's probably a good way for me to uh, introduce Prem to uh, start the demo. And I'm going to skip over the rest of my section so that uh, Prem can continue. And of course, you'll have a copy of this. Uh, after the presentation that we'll be able to send to you with a white paper that you'll be able to download. And also, if any of you get Financial Ops Magazine, uh, we will, uh, uh, there's a big article there. So I'm going to pass the ball over to Prem so that he can uh, continue. Thanks, All right, Prem. Thank you, Art. And uh, in a moment, I'll share my screen. And... Uh, 
for those of you in the WebEx, it may be easier if you haven't already to um, um, to kind of try to use that full screen because it's a little bit easier to see the uh, the screens that I'm about to demo uh, in full screen mode. Uh, and so here's what uh, Copac's offering for a supplier portal is known as uh, Supplier Express. And this first screen I've landed you on uh, landed on here is the simply the login page, right? And um, I'm going to go through this real quick, and I'd encourage you to follow up with Cofax if you see things you like and uh, would like to see a more in-depth demo. Um, but from this page, where you're, uh, the first screen here, where the it's a simple supplier registration login screen, uh, and suppliers will get directed here based on uh, an email invitation that's been sent to them directly or as a result of their request via an open enrollment URL being accepted. So you've got different ways for the uh, suppliers to register and log in. Um, but ultimately, they're going to re register with their email address uh, and creating a password as well as a security question, which uh, uh, is pretty familiar territory, I think, for most people now. Now, once I've logged in, so I've already created a, an account, of course, and I'm uh, logged in. And once I've done this, um, I can log into Supply Express as a supplier. And here I'm logging in as a supplier, uh, a representative of the supplier, Kralin. And I'm going to choose to work with one of the buying companies that I submit invoices to. So you see there's, I'm Kralin, there's two buying companies here. I'm going to choose to look at the invoices. Let's say I have a question about the invoices that I'm submitting to New Technology Corporation. So when I do that, the first page I'm taken to once I've chosen my buying company uh, is an invoice status screen. And this shows me real-time ERP invoice data and status information about all the invoices Kralin has submitted to New Technology Corporation for my specified date range. So I put in a custom date range here previously, and it's remembering it, and it's going back to January 2012, but you could put in a preset date range or put in your own custom date range here. Uh, so ultimately, for this screen and, and others that you'll see, uh, Supplier Express is presenting this real-time ERP data to the suppliers. Uh, but from a security perspective, uh, we're never allowing this, this data that you see here to re actually reside on our hosted site. Uh, this information is always getting pulled in real time from your ERP system through a secure VPN. So that's important from a security perspective. Um, so what you're seeing here, uh, like I said, is the invoice status screen. Um, and not only can I see kind of details on these uh, uh, invoices, but I can also see a summary type table here for the invoices that I've queried up. Uh, so that summarizes the detail records below into these four uh, kind of statuses that you see here, awaiting approval, awaiting payment, paid, and uh, canceled are the four main statuses they'll see. I can also sort the detail records down below here, either by column, by clicking on the column, I can sort them. I can also filter them by any uh, criteria in the search field. So let's say I know either a partial invoice number or something like that, 987, I can just type that in, and it filters out uh, in, my, in my set of invoices. Uh, it looks for 987, and it'll look across all the fields here for 987, and now I have a subset of the invoices I queried. Um, and you can drill down on these invoices for more uh, information. So like, let's say I just double click on this guy. I could also view the image if I like, if there's an image associated with that invoice. I can get some more details about the invoice that you see here all coming from the ERP system. And I also have the ability from here or other tabs to correspond with the buyer, right? So uh, the question here is that they worried about not getting paid and want to know what's happening, that sort of thing. And of course, from the buyer side of the application, you can field these email correspondences and reply back. So other, other screens, other tabs provide uh, similar type information. So I've gone to the payment tab, and simply enough, I can see the payments that have been made. Uh, I can see payments that have been made from New Technology Corporation to Kralin here. And I can see the invoices that have been paid uh, you know, for, those, for those payment numbers or those payment runs, right? So in my case, it's simply one invoice for each payment. Uh, but it could be multiple invoices showing up here. And similarly, for purchase order information, again, I'm seeing all these purchase orders that I have out there with New Technology Corporation, and I can see the individual invoices uh, that I've submitted against those uh, POs. So some good information about payments, some good information about purchase order information. And then, so the, these first three tabs we just covered were inquiry-type stuff. Uh, but you also, the second half of the equation is uh, uh, 
uh, submitting invoices. And we give a couple different options here. Um, and I think one of the one of the good ones that's available, and there that you can see there's others as well. But the PO flip is one that's uh, quite useful if you if you're leveraging POs and want your vendors submitting against POs, uh, PO based invoices. So you can come in here and choose this option, and it's going to lead you to choose one of the available POs. Uh, again, pulling real time information from your ERP system. And if I choose one of these uh, purchase orders, the next screen you'll see is the, the ability to first off put in a, an invoice number. It'll check to make sure it's not a duplicate invoice number. Uh, and then it's actually showing me the line items on that uh, PO. So once I choose the PO from the list and enter in an invoice number, I can now choose how many items I want to invoice for many of these PO lines here. So let's say I take the first line here and you know of the remaining amount, I want to do, let's say, 10 of these. So ultimately, we're now going to be submitting an invoice for this $11,000 based on what I just uh, entered in there, right? Um, so at this point, I can uh, optionally upload PDF backup documentation. So you see here an upload PDF is available. Um, and, and ultimately, at the, if, whether I choose to do that or not, it's going to allow me to uh, send this invoice in. Um, and once this is submitted, uh, it's now sent to the ERP system, and uh, we, of course, COPEX has workflow that's available behind this, and it can submit it into the workflow and, and do the matching to the PO and, and workflow route as necessary. Um, but that's kind of the simple way uh, to submit an invoice. You can also just, uh, instead, of, instead of matching to a PO, you could just uh, upload a PDF if you like. Uh, but just giving the, uh, the supplier kind of easy ways to uh, submit the invoices. So that's kind of uh, the, the high-level view of what uh, what it looks like from a supplier perspective. Pretty simple. They can also do some, of course, user maintenance, self-service user maintenance, uh, that type of capability. From the buyer side of the application, you'll, of course, have a different URL to log into with your own credentials. Uh, and ultimately, it gives you uh, the capability to see the correspondence that's coming through from suppliers on this screen, uh, to work with invited suppliers and also invite other suppliers. Uh, and also, you have some nice, pretty straightforward configuration settings. So uh, pretty easily, you can um, put some personalized things here, like your company logo, um, and, and specify what the invitation text looks like when you invite your suppliers. Uh, so you can, you can kind of cater that to your – and you can do this at a, at a system level, or you can do this at a system level, or you can do it at uh, even a vendor-specific level, so you can have – you know, vendor specifically uh, put in specific information uh, for these. So here you're seeing some uh, uh, general type information, including the logo. You can also kind of cover your open enrollment strategy. So here's your open enrollment URL, um, as well as the text you'll be sending as part of uh, when people register via the open enrollment URL, whether they're whether you're going to accept them or reject them. You can cater the text to uh, uh, text of these emails uh, notifications. Um, the last thing I want to cover, there's other, of course, other settings here you can make, but uh, I think maybe the last high-level thing I want to uh, cover here is uh, some, some reporting feature here of, of, of the usage. And the takeaway here, uh, when you look at this usage report, is that every inquiry, for example, that you see here from the, the two suppliers I currently have in my demo environment, every inquiry that you see here could have represented a phone call to your AP department. So, um, you know, in a real, real live production environment, you're going to uh, hopefully have lots of, um, lots of, uh, lots of inquiries coming in, and uh, lots of capability to avoid uh, having these uh, calls come in. Um, so, that's really the, you know, one of the key ROIs in this uh, solution is the uh, ability, of course, for your suppliers to do self-service and uh, really. Um, you know, not having so much of an onus on your AP department to field a lot of uh, uh, phone calls. So, so with that, I think that's my uh, kind of conclusion to a, a quick overview of the solution. Again, I welcome you to um, uh, follow up with uh, COFAX if you'd like to see more uh, in-depth coverage of that. Um, Art, I'm going to pass it back to you, if you would, for um, just to summarize or conclusion. All right, well, thank you, Prime. 
So in summary, the uh, benefits, I think you all agree that um, improving cycle time, I mean, AP uh, uh, error reduction, uh, according to TAP and, and uh, research, it has trumped all other issues in uh, processing up in the front end. And the cleaner you can get the transaction through uh, by communication with the supplier and improving the quality of the content sent, uh, then you can start to reach this goal of what we would hold straight through processing. And of course, if you're at the 70%, 80% level, that's considered very high, because we know that there are a lot of different quality levels for paper, depending on the number of vendors. And then the support costs for the vendor, the, the ability to scorecard them, assess their spend, uh, assess their discounts, uh, cycle time reduced by eliminating the scanning, and the communication issue, which uh, should not be overlooked, because as we said, that's taking uh, an inordinate amount of time going back and forth with routine calls. So in summary, uh, we have a self-service supplier portal, uh, as other vendors have, and uh, it is hosted, subscription, and the AP department is able to offer this uh, free to their suppliers. So I hope that um, with that, you've enjoyed the presentation, and we're now going to uh, pass it back to Tammy to uh, solicit any questions that you might have and discuss those before we sign off. <clears throat> Thank you, Art. So uh, we are almost at the top of the hour, so uh, I guess we can just um, address probably one or two questions. And I have one here, um, and um, probably Art, you can start off with this, and perhaps Amy, you can probably chime in too. What is um, what is needed to build a business case for supplier portals? Well, I'll just say a couple of words before Amy, but uh, for me, uh, you need to have a uh, a business case built on some quality research, such as provided by Hackett, about the value proposition and the payback that this kind of a solution can build. And then when you're constructing the RRI, obviously you're going to be computing the savings that this would obtain minus the cost of the investment, divided by the cost of the investment, and compute the ROI. But always, uh, I think for your, your domain and your vertical, you need to get metrics that um, show what these world-class performers are, are attaining using this kind of technology. Amy? Yeah, Art, Art, I think you're right on the right track there. I mean, it's, it's you know, it starts with understanding what your current costs are um, and then estimating, you know, based on, based on the investment, what your future costs are likely to be uh, as you Im eliminate. And that really just looks at the uh, efficiency gains, what we call process cost gains from a technology, uh, which are usually enough for a technology like this to justify it. Um, you also need to look at the effectiveness that you're driving in the P2P process. So as you're able to do things, as you automate your process and you're able to do things like drive improved compliance to contracts, both from suppliers and internally from, from employee <laughs> buying, um, as you're able to better manage cash and working capital um, and pay on time more and, and, and get away from supplier penalties um, and build better supplier relationships that generate, you know, more um, complex benefits with the supplier throughout the, for the business, be a supplier or, uh, sorry, a customer of choice, um, there's a lot of effectiveness benefits as well. And um, we could definitely talk more about that. We have benchmarks for a lot of those. Uh, some of them are softer costs, but they're certainly worth driving towards because they are, they do tend to be, the effectiveness tends to be about 12 to 15 percent higher than the efficiency in terms of benefits. All right, thank you, Amy and Art. That's all the time we have today. We have a couple more questions here, and uh, we'll reach out directly to you to address them. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be made available, and we will be emailing it to you. Um, in the meantime, if you have any additional questions, uh, we do encourage you to feel free and reach out to our presenters. Their contact details are listed on the slides. We have Amy's here and as well as arts on the next slide. And um, you can always visit us at cofax.com slash AP or follow us on social media. And once again, we thank you for joining us today, and we hope that today's webinar will be beneficial to you as you can consider adopting supplier self-service tools. Thank you, and have a great week. Thank you again Thanks, for everyone. joining us. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's web conference. You may now disconnect.